he really wanted a dashboard that he could sit in front of where he could have all of the metrics of the business and he could drill down into those metrics and then he could command from that dashboard. Mm. That is decidedly not leadership and decidedly not human. Welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Stefano, and this is When Leaders Talk, a podcast about leadership and, most importantly, about leaders. Leaders have, the best leaders, I would say, have a characteristic that is to be open to learn, is being lifetime learners, being curious. I mean, they don't know any, everything, but they can take in new notions, new inputs, and they can get better. And I found one of those leaders, and this is Brian Pruden. Brian currently is the CFO at Safe Health, but also he's been nominated as the best CFO for 2023 in uh, San Diego. So Brian has a lot, knows a lot about leadership. And we've been talking about diversity. We've been talking about being open, as I said, but also to be human to understand the human side of leadership. And this is what makes leadership, as in his words, the art of management. And also beautifully complex, dealing with humans, having to understand that every person is unique, every team is unique. We've been talking about leadership from a couple of different perspectives out there, not just from the business leading a team in a business environment, in wor working environment, but also leading a group of kids, a sport, because Brian has a great experience as a coach in sports, and he has taken a lot from it. I'm not going to anticipate anything, so you will be inspired, hope, to listen to this podcast. But before I leave you to Brian, let me remind you to subscribe. It is important because if you subscribe, I will be able to have more guests as good as Brian. And uh, we will make this uh, podcast even better. Also, you can follow me on social media like LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And uh, well, with no further ado, Brian Pruden. So Brian, let's start our conversation with the uh, first question. Do you have a definition of leadership? And if you have it, will you share with us? Um, I, I do. There's going to be probably more words. I would. I, I'll. Uh, I'll steal a Mark Twain quote here. I don't have time to give you a concise definition, so I'm going to have to give you a long one. Um, I think it compromise. It. It. it um, there are several components to what defines leadership. Uh, at its core is, you can't be a leader if you don't have followers. Right. Um, I, I, I once, I recently worked for a CEO who could have cared less if he had any followers at all. <laughs> I tried to convince him that, you know, you can't really be known as a leader if nobody really wants to follow you. Right. Um, so, so part of the definition is you, 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 uh, to be a leader by definition, you have to have some followers. Um, I think leadership, as it is contrasted with management, as an example, uh, management is, in, in, by my definition, is a very uh, technical discipline. Uh, there's some proven management techniques that can optimize a result, uh, where leadership is um, is decidedly not a technical discipline. Uh, it it depends on the, to be a good leader. Depends on, um, it has to evolve. It has to be, I believe, in situational leadership. So it depends on, the, in business, if you're leading a, a business team, it depends on what business you're in. It depends on what your team is. Um, different styles work different ways. Uh, I like to think of leadership management as a science and leadership as an art. So maybe I guess I would summarize by saying leadership is the art of management, maybe something like that. Hmm, that's, that sounds, that sounds good, you know, and there is actually the human component in, in, in leadership that is 
if you want, the most, <laughs> the most difficult to deal with. And that's because, first of all, we bring ourselves, right? So it's not like we are, uh, we can separate ourselves from our emotions. So if we are pissed for something that happened, I don't know, at home or we're driving at work, we go to work and we are upset, but you know, and then, and this could affect the, the, uh, actually the, how we behave with people on the, on, on, on work. And on the other side, they might have some problems that could actually impact, impact their, their relationship at work as well. So it's, it's really, I would say beautifully complex, right? There is beauty in it. There is, as you say, and I like what you say, the art of management, right? Um, so what kind of artist are you then? Oh, yes. Um, I don't think anybody's ever accused me of being an artist. I have been accused of being a leader, so maybe there is something there. Um, what kind of a leadership artist am I? I, I, uh, I believe that I'm a lifelong learner, and I'm... I think one of the hardest things to learn about is yourself and other people. And so I'm glad you brought up the fact that leadership involves humans because that it, they are beautifully complex, as you say. And um, the, the I'm a very pragmatic artist, hmm. a very observant artist. Um and I, I think, you know, I think at the end of the day, I've been asked many times, how would people describe my leadership style? And the word I always come, come back to is human. Uh, that, that's what people use to describe me. So, um, and I could explore that further. But yeah, I think, uh, I think that I would be called human. Yeah, actually, I was, I was wondering what you mean by human? You know, what, what's, what's the meaning of being human in this context for you? Yeah, I think, um, and, and I'll, I'll describe my leadership style um, by contrasting it with others. So if I don't have a good term to use, then I'll, then I'll say, well, I'm this because I'm not that. So let me give an example. Um, a leadership style that I don't believe is particularly human is, uh, or doesn't have that component, is one that uh, treats people like they are machines. Uh, I worked for a CEO one time, and his uh, he was a he was a sole proprietor. Uh, was not the founder of the business. He had purchased the business, um, and he really wanted a dashboard that he could sit in front of, where he could have all of the metrics of the business, and he could drill down into those metrics, and then he could command from that dashboard. Mm. That is decidedly not leadership, and decidedly not human. So um, I'm the opposite of that. So I believe in, uh, I believe humans are, are diverse. I think that the, the only reason we exist as a species is due, due to our diversity. I guess that's, that's uh, hadn't really thought about that before, but um, the diversity is what, what, what has allowed us to evolve. Um, and I be strongly believe that you get better business results as a, uh, as a result of having uh, d uh, diverse set of voices, diverse experiences, diverse right. backgrounds, diverse approaches. So I think that also makes me human. Yeah, diversity, it is important, right? Inclusivity, especially today, we're talking a lot about inclusivity for uh, women and other minorities and a, a lot of things. And yet uh, there are so many discriminations and biases. And, and some of the biases probably are so rooted that we are not fully aware of those right um what is what is that you do to be sure that every voice is heard and valued within your team yeah i do believe as a leader it's important to so first of all in business in general you win if you have a diverse set of experiences backgrounds and inputs at the table as you're making decisions that is it's proven by the data and i have plenty of empirical evidence on my own I, they're without a debate um so it's not even worth me trying to quote those things now so back to your question how as a leader 
um, how do you ensure that you're getting that the, the value of that diversity? Because quite frankly, gender diversity or racial diversity, ethnic diversity, those are all markers. You can you can have um, two men and two women that act that have the same background, act exactly the same, and are completely not diverse. So many of those are just markers for that diversity. What you really want as a leader is you want to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people that aren't just like you. That's often difficult. You want to make sure that you're encouraging and supporting. And I'll go one step further because I do this in teams that I, every team that I've led since uh, for, for, for many, many, many years, I'm an extrovert. I think with my mouth, I make statements that are really questions. That's how I operate. And when I'm leading a team, I have to be careful to say that was, that sounded like a statement that was really a question and then stop. And then if I'm on a new team, I often have to say, especially if I come in explicitly as the leader of the team, you know, whether I'm the boss or whatever, you know, I'm some C-level title somewhere and I come in as, you know, hey, this is the person who's supposed to have the answers for us and going to fix all our problems. I make it really clear right up front. I, I don't encourage um, people to disagree with me. I don't encourage that. I actually demand it. It is an expectation that if you don't agree with what I'm saying, that you have to voice that opinion. Now, what I do is I, I, I take it a step further. If someone disagrees with me, I take it a step further. I think active listening techniques are really good to help. You know, all of these concepts are really tied together. But um, if you employ active listening techniques, it helps you reinforce the value of diverse opinions with the team. Because I always try to, especially if somebody's disagreeing with me, I always try to restate back to them, hey, this is what I heard. This is what I think is behind you saying it. Did I get that right? Is that, and then that, that it does a lot of things. One is it, it, it reinforces that you really did listen to that viewpoint. And if you do, it, you know, and as a leader of the team, especially if it's a consultative kind of decision-making uh, authority, which oftentimes it is, um, sometimes you have to overrule and you have to go, you know, you're the boss, you have to live with, uh, live with, with your decisions. So sometimes you do have to overrule, but you know, I find that people want to be heard. The other thing that I always do is I will, uh, I guess I say always, but I'm, I probably try to, I'm sure people that might listen to this say, no, he's actually not that good at that. Um, but what I always try to remember to do is make sure everyone on the call has had an opportunity to speak. So I will stop and call on the person, sometimes to the extent of I will say, hey, we haven't heard from you yet. What do you think? And by the way, your voice is just as, just as important as mine on this topic. And that will catch people off guard, off guard oftentimes, especially if it's a junior employee. Like, Wait a second. I just had this happen, by the way, um, last week. The, uh, the company where I where I, where I had been uh, interim CFO, our our AP clerk was on the call, uh, and we were going through some tough decisions on what vendors we were going to pay and what not to pay, and went around the table. I said what my principles were, and I said, you know, Anna, I haven't heard from you yet. What what do you think? You're the one on the front lines. You're taking the calls of the people complaining. What do you think? And, you know, you can see it in people's faces. They respond well to it. And that's just one example. Um, Zoom does make it somewhat easier to see people's reactions when you're, when you're in that leadership moment, because you can almost see all the faces at the same time. It's different if you're in a room and around the table, then you have to do, but on Zoom, you can see when people shut down. You can see when they have something to say. You can see, you can you can tell by their body language oftentimes if they're not happy with the way the discussion is going. And, you know, those are the type, again, I'm a, I'm a student of human behavior and I, uh, I, I believe you get a better answer through those types of activities. And I want to add one thing it is that, uh, you know, maybe someone thing that just asking questions and listening, even listening, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it can be achieved quickly, but it's not true. You actually, you need to create 
even before the meetings and, and in every day, you need to create this um, fer fertile ground, right? Um, and I want to give you an example. When I was when I was in the Navy, I was a, a junior officer and there was this admiral. He was one of those people who really did not like when someone would say no to him or had a different idea. So it was really not nice to talk to him, right? I mean, especially if you if you thought if you disagree with him, it was and actually he was in this position where you your career would have been uh, at risk, right? And I remember this day we were planning. It was in two thousand six. Uh, the um, there was the the crisis between Israel again and uh, and Lebanon at the time, Hezbollah especially. And we were planning something, and he asked at some point out of the blue, he asked the question, "Hey, what do you think?" You know, something. <laughs> and he wanted everyone of, of us asking, uh, replying to this question. But the problem is that we, including me, I, I want to admit this, I was terrified. I, I was not the only one. Even if I was in disagreement, I don't think I would ever have the courage to really say. And as a matter of fact. Everyone agreed, you know, magically. It was a full consensus. That, and that's, that doesn't work. So what you're saying is beautiful, going back to the point. Going, what you're saying is great. It works beautifully. And, and it's magic, actually, especially in a team. But you need to have prepared the ground for this. It's not an improvisation. It's not like yesterday you were authoritarian and then and very decisive and aggressive and the next day you are all oh, um tell me what you think <laughs> it doesn't work like that right agree uh, yeah yeah there are there are uh, but i like what you say i like the, the the listening part the actually really listen what they're saying um, in an active way and also to allow everyone to express their voice is so important it creates uh, it creates bond it creates sense of ownership it, it really creates trust within a team so so many um you you, you used a word uh stefano that i i think is really important magic and you know we talk about magic as something you can't really put words on or can't understand or how did that happen you know i don't know what the definition of magic is but i use that word um often when talking about management systems and teams and things that work and don't work I talk about things like, um, by the way, first of all, I completely agree with what you said. You can't, <laughs> you're judged by your actions often, not your words. And you, you can't be authoritarian 99% of the time and then expect someone to have the courage to disagree with you. Um, the, uh, uh, it's in the team that the executive team in the, in the company I'm currently with, they have this issue. The, um, I, I described arguing with the, uh, the founder and the CEO, uh, the same way John Kelly, uh, General John Kelly, who was the first, um, first chief of staff to Donald Trump. Somebody asked him, you know, what's it like? You know, your job is to deliver bad news to Donald Trump. What that's, what's that like? And he said, it's like kissing a chainsaw. And, <laughs> This is a this is an analogy I've used frequently um, over, over the last few months. Is that you know if you if if, if if it's really hard to come to your team and say I really want to I really want to know what you guys think when you know the last eight times someone has had to come kiss the chainsaw. And um, I also find and, and, and you, you mentioned having to sow those seeds and the, it's the entirety. Um, the system. And that's why I said many of these concepts are related. Um, nothing I'm going to say today is actually new. These are all things that I've uh, absorbed uh, from seeing successes and failures and seeing, you know, great, great leaders that I've worked with and for. Um, but one of the most magical things is when a team, whether you're the leader of the team or not, or you might be the informal leader of the team. But if you are the formal or informal leader of the team, if you can create an environment where people can disagree and attack the issues and not the people, and you can get diversity, and you can have an argument about something, you're going to get such a better business result 
And the, I think the current, the current terminology on this is uh, psychological safety. Yeah. So they, they're, uh, Google had hired, uh, I think it was Harvard researchers to come in and study a lot of data on teams and the output of the teams came in, studied it, couldn't find a correlation, you know, came back and restudy it. There's actually a book on this right behind them, over here. It's called psychological safety. And um, what they found was there was only one thing that correlated success to that team. The only thing was that this, what that was correlated was having an environment, an environment of psychological safety. And I can tell you, it takes a, takes a fairly strong and confident leader to be able to really nurture an environment of psychological safety, because that leader has to be able to admit they're wrong, has to be able to listen to their team. Um, so it takes, you know, that not everybody's cut out for that. As a matter of fact, in the United States environment, most leaders actually aren't. Well, yeah, that's that's. Uh, I guess it's pretty pretty widespread. And I want to add because you say strength, a strong and confident leader. I want to add the brave, because it's you need to. Well, you need to do something that first of all is not common. <laughs> so you are. Uh, most of us will probably navigate uncharted waters, right? Um, maybe also making mistakes. So and you have to show up with your vulnerabilities in and. Uh, and have an approach that is uh, it, it can be it can be difficult at the uh, real at the beginning because you open the doors to everyone's opinions and 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 everything else because you actually want the people to express themselves and you actually the other thing is that you accept the mistake i mean everyone every each of us make a mistake right i mean even uh, i'm sure even you, you even if you you've been nominated cfo of the year uh, <laughs> uh, at least in the past maybe not this year but you uh you've done some mistakes right and it's it's okay it's okay what i really don't i always found um energy wasting and time wasting is this the blame game when or or really hunting who's the error and who make the error and you spend time and energy it's important i mean it can be important to understand where something failed right but being obsessed about it it's it's really takes a lot away it's not just energy actually it takes also motivation people are scared it's the quite the contrary of psychological safety I, I, unfortunately, you're asking the questions and I'm not. But you know, when when I host the podcast, I'm I'm going to want you to um, m many of the things that that you talk about come from your military background, where the consequences are life and death. Most of the things I'm involved with in business are not life and death consequences. But I can imagine wasting time on the blame game. In certain situations in the military is a life or death issue and in business we should treat it that way we should treat it as if don't waste time blaming people what are we doing next what are we moving forward with what do we learn from it so we don't repeat the mistake and by the way yes i can confirm i've made some major blunders in in my leadership past some are quite humorous now <laughs> thinking about them some i still can't laugh share. about. i'm sure <laughs> okay. so, some i still can't laugh about well i could i'd be happy to share <laughs> as a matter of fact uh one from about 15 years ago somebody reminded me of it just the other day and i got a good chuckle out of it so i'd be happy to share my couple of management blunders with you if you'd like to hear those yeah of course i mean oh uh, well well i could <laughs> I mean, that's, um, that's, that's, sure. that's the juicy part, right? Because it's not just the sure. perspective, the philosophy, it's also the experience that you have that makes you, that made you the, the person that you are, the leader that you are successful. Sure. I'll, 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 I'll share. I'll share. I'll pick two. Um, there's a long list. We could fill an hour with, <laughs> with my mistakes, but I'll, I'll pick two. One's from, one's from quite a long time ago. Some people might be able to relate to it. The mistake I made was, um, I rarely make this mistake now, is I, as a leader, I didn't think through all the implications of my decision and the entire constituency that I was accountable for as the leader. 
Like that was the mistake. I didn't just didn't think hard enough. And uh, so in this example, um, I was leading the team of about 40 people globally, uh, roughly 25 or 30 of them all were co-located in the same, same office. And this was in the late nineties, probably. And uh, we had been through a very difficult uh, budget cycle together. We had about a billion dollar budget that we were responsible for. And this was in big tech at the, it wasn't called that back then. It was called Silicon Valley back then. Um, I guess it's still called that now, but so big company, big, very difficult process, wanted to give everybody a break. And there was a movie that was made that really made fun of our our work environment. It was called Office Space. Office Space was the name of the movie. Don't know if you saw it, Stefano. No. Um, okay. Well, Office Space, those, those watching that did see it probably know where I'm headed. I thought it would be great to show, uh, this was, in, I think it was in the 90s. It might have been the early 2000s. Um, I thought it'd be great to have a movie day in the office. So got a big conference room, take the afternoon, brought in snacks and popcorn. Everybody, we're just going to walk away and we're going to watch this movie that's basically making fun of us. Uh, so everybody get a laugh. Well, if you want to know if a movie is appropriate to watch with your business team, you should first watch it with either your kids or maybe your mom. <laughs> because there were some inappropriate scenes. And quite frankly, there were people in the room that you know, may have violated their religious beliefs to sit in there and watch it. Very, very, very serious. Didn't, you know, it wasn't, I don't even think it was rated R. It might have been, but regardless, I didn't think it through. And people, you know, some of the people in the room had to get up and leave. And um, yeah, that was a huge blunder that everybody that was involved with that still laughs about and gives me a hard time about. Now, I learned I didn't think it through, but I also got to practice something that every effective leader should practice, which is apologizing, owning your mistake, looking someone in the eye and say, that was wrong and here's why it was wrong. And I, and I sincerely apologize for it. And by the way, apologizing is a learned skill. You're not born with it. Those of you that aren't good at it and don't like to do it, or maybe just don't do it at all, practice it. Try it. Your life will be way better. Um, and I, and so I, I got to practice my skills at apologizing. You have to be sincere to it. I was sincerely apologetic for that. So that's one blunder. Um, a more recent blunder uh, from a leadership perspective um, I was in a senior position, had just sold half the company to a private equity firm. The private equity firm had assigned a, a, a general partner to, to this investment, uh, who also became a board member. Uh, and they placed a new CEO who had never had a CEO job before, had never had a job out of government before. So this was a former military. Um, uh, and uh, that person's um, uh, incentive was to be viewed in a positive light by this private equity firm because that was his next path. The general partner that was assigned um, had apparently didn't have much business experience in this particular type of business maybe, or this particular environment, I don't know, but uh, we were started receiving mandates that, that no rational business person would do. And um, I put myself in between the CEO and uh, this board member. And um, to my own detriment. Uh, and had I probably handled that better, I probably would have been more effective at um, bringing those two leaders together. As opposed to me being a wedge between them, I was the chief financial officer, so... I had a certain duty to, <laughs> to, to ensure that certain things were done. And instead of being a wedge between those two individuals, had I been smarter about how to bring them together, then I would have been more effective as a leader within the business and for that leadership team. 
Mm. So that one I haven't fully figured out how I could have done it better, but I know I could have done it better. It was absolutely, you know, um, I'm sure I could have done a better job. But anyway, there's two examples of things that I could have done better as a leader. Well, thank you for sharing, actually. And uh, sure. uh, going back to your first example, it's, uh, it's uh, you are right. We are not told how to ex apologize, especially in a, in, a, in a working environment, right? Actually, uh, um, and I guess in the military is even stronger the sense of pride, you know, and um, and this this mantra that you hear that your boss is always right. So when you get to the to the to be, for example, the commanding officer of a ship. You tend to say, sometimes jokingly, sometimes I think you believe it, <laughs> that you are never wrong. So I remember once, especially once, I had to apologize for a mistake I've, I've done. Um, and I had one team on a boat doing, during on a small boat doing some inspection, you know, so they were uh, kind of a mix of Marines and, 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 and uh, crew members. And we, the ship, the, the, the mother ship, us basically was, uh, was drifting away and we took care of another thing. But as a matter of fact, we lost visual contact with them in the middle of the ocean. So, and I felt, I mean, I was, I was mm, I don't know, confident about their skills, you know, nothing was gonna happen, but having lost visual, was not a problem for me, it was more for them. I knew where they were. They did not know where I was, where we were. So when, when they came back, I, I really, I, I, you know, we always debrief. And the first thing I say is like, I am sorry. I made an incredible mistake. It's a mistake that no commanding officer should ever do. And I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And then. And then I remember one of the guys, the actual team leader who came to me and said, well, you are one of the few people that we, we have ever heard apologizing for, for a mistake they've done. But you know, the point is learning. And, you, and then going back to what you said earlier, you know, you are a lifetime learner, right? So it's, it's always improving, getting better. And I wanna go back to this. Um, I wanna ask a question as a leader, which is the, skill if you want or aspect of leadership you really struggle with the most yes i think uh that's a great question I'd, ha I'd have to come back to what do i focus the most on changing in myself and um well i'll give it uh, again i'll give you two one, one big and one small. I think both affect me negatively as a leader, so I, I need to continue to work on them. One is, um, as evidence probably ever that's on full display currently, is being concise in my communications. <laughs> and I think I think that that is an area that it will will always be a development area for me, um, and. It's an area that I have made significant improvements on, but it makes me a better leader if I will pause and not just think about what I want to say, but think about how I want to say it. Think about it from the perspective of the people that are receiving the communication, because that's what's most important anyway. Uh, how I said it is not really that important. It's making sure that it's received um, appropriately. So, uh, Brevity and being concise and thoughtful in my verbal communications. I think I do a fantastic job of this in my written communications. It's a completely different situation. <laughs> the verbal, um, ver verbal, that's probably something that, so that's a, that skill is true if you're a leader or not. Um, but it does, uh, it, it does have a, a, an impact. Um, I would say a, uh, a, a larger one is having, is recognizing when it's time to take a large 
brave stand on a topic. Mm. So, and, and I don't think I air one side or the other. I think sometimes I overanalyze and don't act soon enough. And sometimes I probably act a little too soon. So being thoughtful about, hey, this, this path I'm about to set my team on or this stance I'm about to take, recognize the, the, the full impact of that and then think through before you take it. Is this the right time to take it? And um, someone that, that used to advise me was an employee of mine. Uh, used to give me great advice all the time. And she looked at me one time and she said, Brian, do you have the patience to wait till the water runs clear on this? And I thought, that's a great visual. Do you have the patience? I'm sure that that is some Zen quote from somebody famous, but do you have the patience to wait for the water to run clear or is it still muddy? And so now, again, I said, I miss it on both sides. <laughs> that quote leads you to wait um, but then again, sometimes I wait too long. So I think that's something that I'll always uh, continue to work on as well, is, is when it's time to take a big, uh, risky or impactful position or stance or direction for the team, knowing the right time to do it. Right timing, right? Yeah, that, that's that, that's important. I understand that. that the, I mean, and going back to you, what you said earlier about brevity, I'm, I'm sure that here you're fine. <laughs> don't worry about that. So don't don't uh, uh, actually doing great. Well, it's it's interesting what you say. And thank you for being open and vulnerable to um, in in exposing yourself a little bit. And one of the things I've learned actually the other day I was listening to, to a podcast and when uh, uh, there was this uh, this guest I don't remember I'm bad with names so I'm sorry, uh, but the the guest was um, making a difference between vulnerability being vulnerable and acting on vulnerability and I say leaders is not just they don't just show up their vulnerability they actually do something about it, so they have a plan. Even if they don't know something, they have a plan to cover the gap. Even, even if they, they are unable to reach um, a goal, they do something to compensate. So there is always, there is always okay, I'm here. I don't, I don't know. I, I was wrong. Um, whatever the vulnerability might mean in the, in the moment. But also there is a step forward. Right? It's not just any steel. It's like, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. No, it's, it's something more. I don't know, but I want to learn. So you tell me and ask, you know, and I want to hear, I want to do better, help me. And that's, that's the beauty of the concept of leading through vulnerability. I, and I love that. And I was like, oh my God, that's so true. It's, it's not yeah, just right. show your wounds, right? It's just, okay, I want to I wanna do something about this. Step one is admitting that you're wrong, but that's, right. that's necessary, but insufficient. You actually need to own it and do something about it. And that, that, yeah. that next step, I mean, that's just one example of what you're talking about, but abs I agree with you hundred percent that you have to act on it. If you don't act on it, then what was the point? It's kind of, you know. Yeah. You know, and sometime, you know, I, I've, I've met a lot of people that have great ideas, great plans, and then and yet they lack the energy for moving the first step. And then the second step and the third. So they are perfect planners, right? Oh, I'm the best strategist in the world. Sure, but then you need to do it. And that's where you know comes some some courage, come you know some some other skills. So it is not just planning. Um, some people have such a fear of failure; they never take that first step. They right. Really I mean, and, and they may might, they might have the best ideas ever, right? <laughs> but you will never find out if you don't if you don't yeah. on, on act if you don't act on it. And that's the same. And as a leader, as a leader, you have to pull those people out. You have to you you have to get them to take that first step. You have to show them that it's safe. You have to by role modeling, and that's I, I think that's a a key differentiator like for leaders is is role modeling. I, I like what you say. This is sometimes it's completely the uh, people are completely uh, stuck in their fear for for failing. 
and then they don't they don't it's hard i mean i, I understand there's no one likes failing no one likes saying mistake and we're gonna do mistakes and we go back to what we said earlier but we all do in italy we say those who eat they make crumbles right it's normal <laughs> so you, you, the only way to yes. keep the, 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 your your table clean your desk clean is not eating but what was the right. point yes. what is the point i love that um, I want to I wanna change a little bit. I want to take another angle of your life that we, we kept hiding a little bit because I know you're a sport coach. And you are a sport coach for, for kids, yeah, for, for, young, for, young, uh, for youngsters. Uh, and I, we, we discussed this actually when we uh, talked the first time and then I, was, I was amazed. You know? and then actually, let me ask you again, what are the teachings that you are taking away from you know, coaching those kids. Yeah, I think um, so. Yes, I have been blessed with the ability, the opportunity to coach um, my children, stepchildren, etc. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm formally retired from that at this point. So, uh, but but I started keeping track at one point, and I ended up coaching 53 different youth sports teams in a variety of sports. Um, baseball is my favorite, did basketball, a little bit of flag football. Uh, that would be um, American football is what you would call it. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then a, a lot of what you would call football or we would call soccer in, and uh, outside of Italy. So, I'm tolerant. I'm uh, tolerant. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes, a lot of soccer. So uh, that experience taught me many, many things. Uh, ch children are, are excellent to learn from about human behavior, a an outstanding source of teaching for human behavior, actually. Um, so two big things come to mind off the top of my head. One is um, what works for one person doesn't work for all people. Uh, that is true in in coaching anyone, especially coaching children, uh, and definitely true in business. I think uh, I've spent a large part of my career with very large companies, and now I guess even a bigger part of my career at small to medium-sized companies. And um, in the in the small to medium-sized companies, you see a lot of one one hit wonders. You you see people do, who are a victim of their own success because they had some massive financial success and now they have a recipe. And then they try to apply that recipe in other places and it doesn't work. Um, again, I call that being a victim of your own success. The same thing can happen in coaching teams. You can have a team where you have the magic, where it really does well. Then if you try, if you try to apply that same technique at the next team, you may fail miserably. Hmm. Like fail, like actual fail. Because you, you can't use a recipe. There is no recipe. What you should have is a playbook. The playbook, that, that, those are the different plays that you use depending on the situation and the team. And so I think learning, and by the way, this, well, I, I learned this lesson the hard way. I had coached uh, my oldest son, older son, uh, through a variety of teams. And then it was time to coach my older daughter group of young girls. I think they were playing soccer. I think it was soccer. It was probably soccer. Yeah, it was soccer. And I just approached them the same way. No, that clear failure. I was not made motivating those young girls the same way I was motivating the young boys. So I had to adapt to that. So that's lesson number one that I've learned from coaching youth sports. Lesson number two, which is probably even more impactful, is I saw firsthand the effect that happens when you get your team to achieve more than they thought possible. By the way, this is true on the individual level as well. So if you can get an individual to accomplish something that they didn't think they could accomplish, then it becomes what I call a self-reinforcing cycle. It just gets better and better because if that team accomplishes something they didn't think they could, then next time they're going to set their goal higher. And next time they're going to have the confidence to have that determination required to actually hit those goals. 
Mm. And so that's that self-reinforcing goodness. So I always see my my role as a as a leader, as coach, mm. in in really spurring that team to say, no, we we can do this. I, it, yeah, it's hard. It's that's it, it, this is going to be a uh, aggressive goal, but it's achievable. And and then celebrate the interim, you know, the wins, incremental wins and learn from the incremental losses. But if you can really inspire that team to accomplish more than they thought they could, it really is magic. And I, I, I did this, I saw it happen on the sports field. Then in business, I took a goal for my team. And again, back to this was back to the the bigger team of 40 ish people around the globe. There was a big finance team supporting a big, big function of a big company. And um, I took the goal that in, and we were a support organization. We were the finance organization for the IT organization, which is a support organization for a big company. So we were multiple levels removed from the business. And this was not a place where people that worked for the company really wanted to come work. And I told that team, because I fundamentally believed it, I said, within a year, people are going to be knocking on our door to come work in our organization. No, we're a support organization to a support organization. We're, um, no, it happened. And that touched a lot of people's lives. People still reach out to me and talk to me about that. Like, how did we do that? And I've asked... I've been asked to come speak at like Salesforce to senior leadership there about this concept. And, you know, it, it, it really, um, and again, it reinforced that, take that bigger goal and inspire the people to accomplish it. And, and that's when the magic happens. Like, like you said, I'm going to steal your word again. That's magic. Can't explain it, but it's, it's magic. You have used uh, a keyword that is to inspire. And even if you ask, that's, that's when, it, when you are able to ask for something that seems impossible, but it's not. It's just a matter of being able to motivate your team to do that. Once again, I've seen many leaders asking for impossible things, but not inspiring, not transmitting the, the why, right? Not being able to communicate the why. Maybe they had a why, but for them it was just, let's do this. There is no motivation in imposing a very hard, difficult job, task that seems impossible. And also what you say when you, when you talk about, you know, every team be unique. And that's another lesson that I've learned on my skin because I was, I had a, 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 a commanding officer tour um, it was uh, 2013, and it was, and I was, it was fun, a lot of energy, beautiful crew, and 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 I really enjoyed the, the year. And then uh, the next commanding officer tour was after six year, different ship, different people, probably also different me. But I tried the same approach; it didn't work at all, at all. I have struggled so much. And I was banging my head on the door every every night trying to understand what's wrong. I mean, it was so great. What I did six years ago was great. It was just different people. And finally, I realized that. Finally, I realized that. And that's so, was so revealing, right? I was like, oh, it's not the same team. Well, I have, right. to, I have to compliment you that you didn't, uh, what leaders that have been a victim of their own success will do, or those that have the fundamental in inability to question uh, their own beliefs um, or their own confidence because they're not strong enough to do that. They'll oftentimes look at that team and say that team was substandard. Like, what's wrong with those people? And you didn't do that. You said, you said what am I? Well, a lot of leaders won't do that. The good leaders, though, will. They'll say, "What is different here? You didn't. I didn't hear you blame them once. You didn't see that. You didn't say. You didn't start that story with. I had this really good team one time, and then I had this really bad one. You didn't say that. 
And that's the mark of a good leader. Yeah, well, uh, you learn to to deal with the people that you have, right? I never had the opportunity to choose anyone, right? So it was like, okay, you know, that's that's where I go. That's where the that's the the people that we work with me, and I will try to make the best uh, with the people that have. You know, that's always been my goal. Um, Not all the teams are the dream team. Well, that's that's true. I mean, that's. We know it, right? I mean, that someone is better, someone is less motivated. Yet, yeah. if you find the right key, you can have a lot from the people working with you, even from the one that are considered less skilled. So true. It is. It is. Um, yeah, I'm a fundamental believer that uh, everybody has some something to add, and you know. Right. As a leader, if you're not getting what you want, eh, there are issues sometimes. You need to take action, but it's just maybe I haven't been smart enough to figure that that out yet. Yeah, I mean, if the old team is going bad, the problem is not the team; is is the leader. Right? If the team is not performing, the problem is not the the, the team. Well, um, we we don't have much time left. So I have uh, the last question that I really want to ask you. And uh, first of all, thank you for all the things you've said. There are so many takeaways for me, you know, and uh, I really love what you said about the the, 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 uni- the unicity of, of a team, you know, how every team is different and how it's important to recognize this. And that's why I related to my experience. I was like, oh, yes, of course. And also the, the the way you showed up your struggles, you know, and, and you were quite open and adamant about it. I was really appreciating that. But you know, the the, the last question is um, is more like if if someone approaches you and say, Brian, I'm, I want to be a great leader like like you are. I want to I want to become the CFO, the best CFO of the whole world in a few years. <laughs> What what are the, the, the other than of course the, the competence <laughs> that's that's fundamental. But what, what, what are the other suggestions you will give to this person? A few things. One is uh, especially in a CFO role, but I think this is true in any role. Um, question everything, especially yourself. Be curious question everything and as soon as you have as soon as you think you've figured out the problem question yourself seek contrary evidence to that's one rule uh, I would say uh, the other is truly fundamentally believe that everybody has something to add really treat people like human beings that because guess what? That's what they are. Treat them as if, you know, you, I never want to work for a company where I wouldn't want my kids to work there or, you know, yeah. hire somebody in my family. You know, you treat people as human beings, treat them the same way that you expect to be treated in the same way, same way you would expect your children to be treated if they worked there. I, you know, I would tell people, don't ever forget that. These are human beings, treat them fairly. They're smart, always smarter than you think. They're, and they always have more to add than, than you think. So um, treat people as humans. Um, and then specifically for the CFO role, um, and this applies in a few other roles as well, but specifically, there are things that you need to know that it's... Um, fundamentally unacceptable. I, I once had a boss come up to me. I attended a meeting and I have always been comfortable saying, I don't know, I'll get back to you if I don't know. And, um, but that, but don't let, ever let that be a crutch. And I had a boss come up to me after a meeting. He physically grabbed me by my shirt. And he looked me in the eye and he goes, it is unacceptable for someone at your level not to know that. <laughs> I said, got it, boss. Um, understood. <laughs> So, you know, in some roles, you do need to go get educated on core topics and, you know, rely on your network and um, uh, always have the courage. If you don't know something to say, I don't know, but then go off and learn it. Take your licks and go off and learn it. So, um, and then, you know what, that's three, but I'll give a fourth, um, which is related to the first one. Be curious. 
you know, I, 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 I just, I, I wish in my life that I had figured that out a long time ago to hire people that are curious. If, they, if you hire people that are intensely curious about the business and how it works and people or whatever, you're going to get a better business answer as a result. So just be curious, lean into that. Don't lean away from it. And lastly, my fifth one, don't let anybody hold you down. Believe in yourself and have the courage to stand up for yourself and your beliefs and, and do that. You'll sleep well at night. And, and that's, that's my parting thought. Actually, my parting thought is, uh, Stefano, I, I am remiss by saying how appreciative I am that you asked me to be on when leaders talk. I, I feel, um, that's uh, quite an honor and I love the podcast. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. That's very important. Actually, you say this, and it's I love it too. I mean, it's it's for me. It's really fun, and I love hearing stories. And your is 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 a great story. Your experience, your perspective on leadership is amazing. And as I said, there are a lot of takeaways. So, really, thank you for having been with us. Mm -hmm.